Moko, an ancient and evolving tradition which has inspired not only this performance piece by Atamida Dance Company, but a movement. When I was about six or seven, I remember Pat Hohepa came up to Whangaruru to visit my grandmother. And I remember him saying to me then, look at you, you've got just the face that should have a moko. And in the back of my head, since the time he said that, there was always that thing that I just kind of knew someday that I would. Moko, it's almost a familiar sight in our communities, in courtrooms, in Parliament and in our universities. On stage and on television, Moko is back. But this uniquely distinctive Māori art form and expression was almost lost to us. Two game changers made a difference. The person that I saw live with a moko was Eva Rickard's mother. We'd go out to Raglan every weekend and she'd be sitting outside the store and I'd sit there and talk with her while I had my ice cream because she fascinated me, she was so beautiful. Nobody I kn knew in my circle had friends or acquaintances who had moko kawai. What inspired you to get that? Uh, the moko was really about the response to the gangs putting all their fists and their dogs around on their funnel. And that um, we need to do something. Tame Iti, one of Tame's most revolutionary acts, was to take on the mata ora, or full facial moko himself, to move it back into the mainstream. Deirdre Nehua, for whom the act of receiving moko kauai was a declaration of pride and resilience. Tame Iti and Deirdre Nehua, back in 1990, part of a small group of game changers. I asked a lot of kaumata and queer that I respected, and the only one who was gave me a positive opinion was Tita Fai. I said to her, I'm really wanting to get a moko kawai and I have the opportunity to get it done. Who should I talk to? And she said, yourself, you're the one that has to wear it. All of the kaumatua that I spoke to at home, really, really disappointing response. They all said, don't do it. Uh, some of them said it'll make you ugly. We had some conversation and around the money ourselves in Ruatoki and, and talk to the kaumātua and talk about how we go to Whakaru mō tērā, mō tērā mō māhua. And they said, oh, why who here? Leave it yeah. alone. You know, that was the cordial. And I said, well, are you saying, why are you not going to mō tērā? Are you not going to mō tērā? Are you not going to mō tērā? Well, that sounds like what it is, you know, because the moko, I understand, he whakapapa tērā. And they had a wānanga at the university. I thought I would go up and say, you know, here's, here's a pattern that I think would look nice. It wasn't like that. Uh, they wanted to have a kōrero to me, about me, where I was from, the sorts of things I was involved in, and the design was done around that kōrero. When it was finished, uh, they set me up and I saw it in the mirror. You know, I felt really overwhelmed and Sid cried, which was really overwhelming because uh, he was just really, really proud. We didn't have any uh, moko artists around in uh, two ways during that time. So we talked to uh, a tattoo artist down in Waimana. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and he was a little bit mataku about doing that. Well, it's a Because he had thing. no idea about what it is. And they said, I'll go and see the fella down the road. So we had a guy like um, Hue Rangi. And the people, they got the, the kōrero and the knowledge, uh, the carvers, and then 
uh, introduced him to uh, to Haruru, Pero, the artist, and uh, so he was a lot more uh, relaxed. When I went into my mother's house, she was really angry with me. Her exact words were, what's all that bloody scribble on your face? And Sid, why oh, he was such a hero. <laughs> he stepped right in between us and said to her, don't you dare speak to my wife like that. Then he said to me, come on, we're leaving now. She never believed any of her children would do that. And now the only two daughters that she has have done that. She come from a generation where being Māori was not a good thing to be. Being Māori was something that was criticised at every turn and I think she was a product of her time. I, I do think it was a shock for Mum to realise she had a Māori daughter, maybe. <laughs> It must be quite amazing now when you see how many people walking around with moko. Oh, because, because you were, I mean, you were the first male that I ever saw who wasn't in a gang. I had a lot of trouble. Yeah. You know, was, just what? going to places, going to the bars, going to clubs, going to different places, I booted it out. So you got to commit yourself, break down those chick on the cover that doesn't belong to you. What about our people, though? How did they respond? Our queer were, were amazing and, and, I, and they just constantly were touching my face. Our men were not. And many men who knew that I wasn't fluent in te reo Māori refused to speak English to me and as I think as a way of trying to put me down and say if you can't speak te reo Māori, you have no right to wear a moko kawai. Many a times I have been stopped by Pākehā people and, and talking and they get them to come and sit and have a talk to me about it. And uh, by and large, people were really good. I wear my strength upon my face, comes from another time of place. We were walking down the streets of Las Vegas and this black guy was coming towards us and he was staring and staring and he swung back around and came back and he said, excuse me, that on your face, is that like some tribal thing? And I went, yeah, I suppose you could say that. He goes, man, that's some cool shit. <laughs> 30 years ago, Tama Iti and Deirdre Nehua inspired me to write this song, Moko, just as they inspired others, including Deirdre's daughter, Casey, to join a movement. Those things that mark you as being, belonging to your people, are things that everybody should wear proudly and walk in this world proudly with them. Mm -hmm.